everyone, and welcome to the Center for American Progress. It's a great pleasure here to have everyone here today to talk about credit cards and, uh, in particular, in the midst of this uh, economic crisis that we face, the, both uh, their role and, and what we should do to make sure that they're a, uh, a tool for credit management for American consumers uh, and not a source of additional financial hardship. Um, over the last uh, year and a half, uh, we've become, I think, more acutely aware than ever that occasionally uh, markets work best when there's a level playing field, when there's transparency, when there's uh, equality of bargaining power, and when there's a fundamental fairness. And unfortunately, for much of the last decade or more, uh, we've been gripped, I think, in Washington by a certain fear that uh, somehow or other f our financial markets were so uniquely creative, uh, so uh, innovative, that that innovation was creating wealth and that if the public were to step in and take action to regulate or impose some ground rules for how that action how those relationships with consumers were to occur, that somehow or other we would sap some of that economic ingenuity out of the private sector and essentially destroy wealth. We learned, in fact, that sometimes uh, that um, when the, the market doesn't have the right parameters set, the competitive forces can actually have the opposite effect, and that the wealth destruction that's happened has happened in now in sometimes in, the, in an unfettered marketplace. But that doesn't answer the question, what's the right regulatory framework to be had? And that's really the debate that we are going to try to have a little bit of today. We're going to talk about two sets of proposals. First, we'll be very, we're very lucky to hear from Congresswoman Maloney, who has been a leader uh, in the area of credit card regulation, and I'll uh, introduce her a little further in the moment, and also talk about a new paper. Uh, uh, written by one of our colleagues, Tim Westrich, that proposes uh, a different model of regulation that takes advantages of the new technologies of the 21st century. Um, I think it is uh, safe to say that uh, the role that credit cards play for American consumers has never been more important. Uh, long before the crisis started, it was clear that um, American families were seeing rising costs and yet not seeing rising incomes. And the ready availability of debt meant that uh, dependence on, on all sorts of debt, and today we're talking about credit cards, became greater than it's ever been before. Uh, and at a time of economic hardship when there's going to be disruptions in people's incomes, the availability of credit becomes even more important. So we started in a place of great dependency, and now we're at a moment when both credit availability and, and having uh, uh, access to credit on reasonable terms is uniquely important. And so what are the ground rules going to be for that? Um, I think we're going to start uh, uh, today uh, with a, uh, some remarks from Congresswoman Maloney, who will talk about her legislation. Carolyn Maloney has represented uh, the 4th Congressional District uh, from New York uh, for, uh, since 1993. She's been a leader on women's and family issues from her, very, her days on the New York City City Council. She has been a strong supporter of the 9-11 Commission and efforts to ensure that their recommendations were implemented. But uh, and most important for today, she has been a leader in the area of financial services. Uh, she is not only a uh, chair of the Joint Economic Committee uh, and a member of the Financial Services Committee, she has, uh, is the author of a piece of legislation, the Credit Card Holders Bill of Rights, H.R. 627, which was introduced in the last Congress and uh, passed in September by a vote of 312 to 112. It was uh, really the first time that legislation uh, uh, offering credit card protections had passed the cha uh, or ch either chamber of Congress since the early 1990s. Uh, she introduced the bill again in the 111th Congress on January 15th with 41 original co-sponsors, including Chairman Frank, and the prospects for passage in the House again are, I think, very clearly strong. Uh, in the Senate, I hope she'll tell us a little bit about her thoughts about uh, uh, what's likely to happen next, how this relates to the regulatory activity taken by the Fed. Um, and I uh, uh, then hope that we can uh, uh, reflect after that 
about um, where we might go next beyond that proposal. But let's start with Congresswoman Maloney. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be here with the Center for American uh, Progress. Uh, uh, you, you really play a vital role in so many important issues before our country. And uh, this is an issue, credit card reform, that really touches a nerve. Almost everyone has a credit card story. I can't go to the floor of Congress without hearing credit card stories. And as you know, I've been fighting for, for credit card reform throughout the last Congress, and uh, I have reintroduced my bill in this Congress. In the last Congress, we had over 155 co-sponsors, and it passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support. We received over 54 editorials from across the country, and uh, we were endorsed by many important uh, consumer and government groups, including yours. And we are going to move this legislation forward in this Congress. Chairman Frank has said that he would like the bill to be on the floor and passed by March. And Senator Schumer has introduced it in the Senate, along with Senator Udall, who is a leader on this issue in the House. And, of course, Chairman Dodd uh, continues to have this as a top priority uh, on his list of priorities. Uh, since I've, I've been working on this bill, I've heard so many stories about credit card practices that are just shocking. Uh, literally, they come in every day. And I just want to share one that came in yesterday. Yesterday, a gentleman called my office, and he said that he was a Reagan Republican from a small town in Illinois. He runs a small business, and he depends on his credit cards, not just for personal expenses, but for day-to-day -day expenses for his business. He said that his rate was jacked up on one card from 16% to 26%. And when he called them, they said that the computers were down for two or three weeks, so they could raise his rate but they could not lower it. And furthermore, they could not give him any reason why they raised the rate. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they call when their rates jump, and they are given absolutely no reason as to why the rate jumped up. On his second card, they raised the rate from 10% to 30% because they said he was late. He had paid online, and in the very small print it says that when you pay online, you have to pay 48 hours in advance of the deadline. Uh, this is the sort of uh, thing we hear all the time. People are being treated unfairly in ways that just don't make uh, common sense, in ways that violate basic principles of contract law and the basic principles of the free market. Ask your friends, your coworkers, uh, your mechanic, your insurance agent. I can't even walk down the street without someone coming up with the credit card stories, and they give you an earful. And I would say these deceptive practices are bad for business. I can't tell you how many people call up and say, I'm so outraged, they won't even give me a reason. I am tearing up all my cards and throwing them away. Now, that doesn't help the consumer. It doesn't help business. It doesn't help the economy. Last year, the Federal Reserve proposed a rule to curb practices that my bill addresses. Uh, they, they had determined that they were unfair, deceptive, and anti-competitive. Uh, when the Fed asked for comments from the public on their proposed rule, they got an astonishing, unprecedented uh, number of responses. Over 56,000 consumers wrote in to the Federal Reserve, the most ever in history. And the Fed issued its final rule in December of this, this year, and it, it closely tracks my bill, but the rule does not become effective until 2010. And why should people have to wait a year and a half to be treated fairly? Why should we allow these practices that are bad for consumers and the economy to continue uh, for a full year and a half? Credit cards have become a very important essential tool in every corner of our modern society. Consumers draw upon uh, instant credit and can make purchases around the world safely and securely. Small businesses can use the flexibility and individuals can use the convenience. But we have allowed the economic playing field to become tilted too much in favor of the credit card issuers. And how good is a contract when only one person gets to set all the terms? And in this case, it is the credit card companies. Disclosures are all but incomprehensible. Even if you read through all the fine print, all it, at the very end of it, it says, and I quote, we can change these terms any time for any reason. End quote. As that character on Saturday Night Live used to say, well, you know, there's always something. 
In recent years, credit card holders have lost the ability to say no, to better manage their own credit, to unfair interest rate hikes and fees, and we have seen all to our dismay these unfair and deceptive practices are not only bad for consumers, they're bad for the businesses and bad for the economy. They destroy trust and consumer goodwill and far too, too often help to create debts that simply cannot be repaid. I am a strong believer in the free market system, but I also agree with Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke when he testified before the House Financial Services Committee that, and I quote, disclosure, end quote, is not enough. And that is why I introduced uh, my, my credit card bill of rights. I began working on this uh, uh, years ago when I, in the last Congress, as chair of the Financial S Subcommittee on uh, Financial Institutions and, and Consumer Credit. We assembled a, a brain trust of uh, the six largest issuers, uh, consumer advocates and experts in law and, and economics, and we held a series of merry meetings and roundtable discussions, and we came forward with a set of gold standard practices to encourage voluntary action. But we found that legislation was the only way to correct uh, the market dysfunction that these practices had created. We needed to level the playing field, not just for the consumers, but for competition. Otherwise, issuers who adopted these better practices suffered a competitive disadvantage. I will say that Citibank was part of, they're part of our panel today, and they were part of the Gold Standards Committee, and they voluntarily uh, adopted the gold standard practices, uh, thinking that all other issuers would follow suit. Of course, they didn't. Uh, so they found themselves in a competitive disadvantage. Other major issuers, uh, another one also, voluntarily uh, went forward with some of the uh, proposals of the gold standards. First and foremost, this le legislation will put an end to unfair, arbitrary, any time, any reason, interest rate increases. This legislation prevents card companies from unfairly increasing interest rates on existing card balances. Retroactive increases are permitted only if a cardholder is more than 30 days late, if a pre-agreed promotional rate expires, or if the rate adjusts as part of a variable rate. I must say the, the um, retroactive rate increase on existing balances I, I feel is the worst abuse. And uh, many cardholders will say that they have a card, they, they were told this would be their rate, uh, for some reason it jumps up, and they put it back retroactively on their balance, and they are in a never-ending cycle of debt. They cannot get out of it. They just pay on the interest. They can't even pay on the principal, and it is really uh, extremely abusive and, and wrong. When an interest rate is being increased for new and future balances, the bill requires card companies to give 45 days notice. And so the cardholder can make a decision whether they want to opt in to the higher rate or whether they want to pay off uh, the, their bill at the existing rate. This bill's in competition because then the cardholder can look around and see if there's another issuer that has a rate that they feel is fair and then switch to that rate. So this is one way that really helps consumers to better manage their own credit. The bill lets consumers set hard credit limits and will stop excessive over-the-limit fees. Uh, cardholders want to manage their, their debt. They don't want to get into debt. If, the, if they set a, a limit, they want to say, I don't want to go over $1,000 or 2000 or five or 10 And then it, it sets that limit. They will not go over it. They will not get the uh, fees for going over. Uh, many times the fees are, are higher than what they even have in their bank account. The bill ends unfair penalties for cardholders who pay on time and stop practices that effectively change interest rates or charge interest rates on balances already paid, such as double cycle billing. How fair is that? to charge them interest on a balance they've already paid. The bill requires fair allocation of consumer payments by prohibiting the walling off of a high interest rate balance from payments. And the bill uh, protects cardholders from due date gimmicks by giving consumers at least 25 calendar days to, end in, to send in their bill and, and credit payments as on time as long as the payment is received before 5 p.m. on the due date. Uh, this to me is a uh, some uh, card issuers uh, have a lot of uh, sort of tricks and gimmicks, and uh, 
Uh, so they tell me they change the due date. They'll, they'll say they have 20 days, then they make it 19 days, or they change the time, and then they then are hit with an interest rate increase. The bill prohibits um, vulnerable cons consumers from high-fee subprime credit cards and bars issuing credit cards to vulnerable minors. The, these are all practices that have been labeled by the Federal Reserve as unfair, deceptive, and anti-competitive, and have contributed to an enormous amount of consumer suffering. This legislation scored a major victory last year when it passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan support, but unfortunately last year it failed in the Senate. On a separate but very important front, the Federal Reserve Board, the Office of Thrift Supervision, and the National Credit Union Administrator put forth new regulations that would ban unfair or deceptive acts and, and practices related to credit cards. And these re regulations, which largely track my legislation, were finalized in, in December. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said earlier, they will not go into effect for consumers until 2010. At a time when the American people are being asked to come to the rescue of financial institutions all over the country, how can it be viewed as, as how, how can it be viewed as the right message for the federal government to send to them that yes, these practices are unfair and deceptive, but we will only let them get away with doing it to you for another year. If they're unfair and deceptive, we should pass them now, put them into law, let's stop these practices. Uh, the newly reintroduced legislation is virtually identical to the legislation that passed the House last year. And, uh, but the, the one area that is different, it would speed up the implementation date to three months from the day that the President signs it into law. In the upcoming months, my, my goal is to get this legislation to the floor for a vote and ultimately to the President's desk for his signature. And in that effort, I will once again need the, uh, the support of this very important um, organization. Your, and, and you have really been a valuable partner in the past uh, on passing this bill and so many other important measures. And I uh, expect that even though the Fed has the rule in place, I expect that there will be very strong opposition to this legislation. I, I believe the opposition will be fierce as it has been in the past. There will be significant uh, pressure to let the regulations run their course and allow for a year and a half to lapse before consumers are protected from unfair practices. But how can we in good conscience let a practice that are so unfair uh, continue to go on? And while I applaud very much the work of the regulators, I think it's Congress's responsibility to act and act now to put the force of law behind these new policies and provide consumers with the protections they deserve as quickly as possible. A rule is just that, a rule. A rule can be changed under another administration or under different circumstances. So I feel that we have to put the force of law behind this important uh, uh, issue. I must say that passing it uh, was a labor of love. It uh, would not have happened without the uh, dedication of many uh, strong consumer groups. I see their presence here today, and I thank them for having uh, been part of this victory uh, for the American public. Thank you very much. I think the Congresswoman has the ability to stay for just a few minutes before she needs to go back to Capitol Hill. So before we do the panel, we wanted to break now and give people in the audience an opportunity to ask questions if there are any. Please, if you would, raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you and uh, then ask if you would identify yourself and your organization. So first there and then there. Thank you. I'm um, with myself. Uh, part of your legislation, two issues I, I don't know if you addressed. One, in terms of where the bills are mailed from, like if you live here, but the billing is out of a lot of companies, credit card companies move their billing out of state to avoid paying the business and occupation tax. Even department stores such as Nordstrom moved out of Washington State and they bill from Phoenix. So they send the bill from Phoenix and if you have a Nordstrom's card and you live here, you know, you have to deal with the date it was mailed and the due date when the payment is due. And the second thing is credit unions operate a little bit differently than the regular credit. I mean, my credit card is with a credit union, so it is different. And the third thing, I don't know if your bill addresses this. Well, I'm not sure. We really, it is a responsibility. I learned 
the fixed rate and stuff when changing cars that the bank person at my credit union taught me. So we, we customers really have the responsibility of learning what it means with an APR fixed and all that other stuff that I didn't understand. And I think there needs to be some real education out there for folks who are getting credit cards. Thank you. Well, it, it covers all issuers from whatever source. Uh, as you know, even stores issue their credit cards, so it, co it covers credit unions. And, and it gives you 25 days to pay uh, from, from – uh, so that's – and so that, that there's a specific date so that you know when it's due and you can um, uh, move to make sure your payment is made. The date from when it's mailed, 25 days. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, in the gray sweatshirt in the front here first. Uh, this one first. <laughs> I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate that you hide. Could you identify yourself? Uh, Ian Milheiser, and I'm today here on behalf of myself. Um, I appreciate your comments highlighting several abusive practices that the credit card companies engage in. One additional practice is when you get a, a, a credit card, frequently you have to sign a contract that contains what's called a binding arbitration clause. And as a condition of this, you sign away your ability to go to court if that credit card company breaks the law. And instead, you've got to go to a privatized forum where, according to one study, the credit card company wins 94% of the time. So you don't get a fair hearing. I love that you're adding new substantive protections to the law. But what good are those if um, credit card companies can force you to sign a contract where you don't get to invoke the law when they break it? Well, I, I, I know the point that you raised, and uh, that can be addressed in another piece of legislation. It's not part of this particular piece of legislation, and it, it did not cover every single issue that is out there. Uh, like many pieces of legislation, uh, we had uh, many people put their best thought forward, and and uh, this is what we're moving forward with at this point. But uh, it does stop a lot of other uh, abuses. Uh, you, you say that uh, it was unfair in the contract uh, that they force you into binding arbitration. I would say it's also unfair in the contract that they say they can uh, raise your rates any time for any reason, that they can do double cycle billing, that they can uh, change your due date, uh, that they can uh, do practices uh, that are out there. What we, what we aim to address were the most abusive practices and uh, we came forward with the top most abusive practices. And to my knowledge, the Financial Services Committee has never passed a credit card reform bill ever. So this is the first credit card reform bill ever to get out of the Financial Services Committee and to pass the United States Congress. So I feel that it's an important step forward. Is it the answer for every single uh, situation that's out there? No. but. Uh, Tomorrow is another day, as we see with a stimulus package that is changing hourly. Uh, you can come forward with another uh, bill and move forward. I would say that it's been a very difficult fight to pass it, uh, and I think it's still a difficult fight to pass it. And I, I think we should go forward with the, the product that has built the consensus. Now, there are many other good ideas, and uh, I am no longer the chair of the subcommittee on, on financial institutions and consumer credit. It's uh, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, he could put forward another reform bill tomorrow that can address many other things. But wouldn't it be nice to have a law that stops the five top most abusive practices? And, and that's what we're pushing forward. Every bill can be changed. It can be added to. Uh, you, you raised an important point that has a considerable amount of support in Congress. And, and, uh, and it's not part of this bill, but it can be part of another bill. All right, let me do one more question, I think, up here, and then we're going to go uh, allow the congresswoman to get back to the Hill. We're oh. having very important votes today. We're, we have the S-CHIP bill on the floor, uh, which we hope to get to the president's uh, desk, uh, just to uh, state that uh, I was mystified by many things the Republicans did, but vetoing the children's health bill I could not, not understand for healthy children, for children who need health care. And uh, we, we want very much to get this bill to the president's floor, and I know the bill is coming up. I do want, uh, want to add also that uh, I was uh, thrilled when President Obama, in his acceptance speech, um, uh, accepting the Democratic nomination, uh, mentioned the credit card bill of rights and, uh, and his work on that, which I want to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. General Obama spoke about, and you, in piggybacking on this gentleman, is if this is in the uh, 
legislation you're proposing and you know no increase you know, 25 days no increase of rates uh, what would happen if this is if the companies break this is there a provision in your bill that there would be automatic penalties on the on the companies or would it be up to individuals to take it as this gentleman said presumably only through arbitration if that's the only way the credit card companies you know allow you to get a credit card uh, and would the, then the enforcement be dependent upon a whole bunch of people saying you broke this clause in the new law we're all taking you to arbitration and that you know shaming the companies into something or is there some other mechanism in the bill there there are there, there are millions of credit cards out there but there are really six major issuers in the country and these major issuers are very responsible financial institutions and they are responsible for eighty percent of the credit card business in America. Uh, I can assure you they will be following the law. If there are abuses, uh, I, I, I can assure you they will be corrected very quickly or they'll be put out of business. Just call your congressperson and uh, we will uh, get the full weight of law after them. I think uh, w once you have a law, you have something very substantial, very clear. Uh, people know the rules of the game and I, I would hope that issuers would be, passing, would be following them. If they, if they are not following them, uh, you, you could have them enforced um, by just going to the to the uh, uh, to, to the the police to to anyone. I mean, I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't follow the, the the outline of the bill. But if they don't, let us know and we'll force them to or close them down. Great. Um, if everyone could join me in thanking the congresswoman, and we'll move on to our panel after she has moved. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. to join me up front and we're going to um, move from here to uh, our panel discussion. Okay, why don't you come on. All right. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to start because uh, I just have some preliminary remarks, and then uh, 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 we'll get we'll get going. Um, so I wanted to uh, to uh, use the congressman's remarks as an opportunity to segue the conversation into a broader discussion about uh, credit cards. Um, uh, we are uh, the 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 bill that Congresswoman Maloney described provides protections against many of the most common and perhaps some of the more deceptive and troubling practices that are currently uh, in the marketplace. Um, uh, but I think there is, uh, there, as, she, as she noted, there will always be questions about whether a particular practice <clears throat> is helpful or not. And part of what we wanted to do here today is to, to talk about what uh, I think the credit card companies have a unique interest at this current moment in uh, making sure that consumers are able to manage their debt. I, 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 think you, <laughs> um, I think that's always been a concern, but I think especially at this moment with the rates of charge up growing uh, 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 very, very rapidly and the kinds of income constraints that more and more of their consumers are facing, it's going to be a bigger uh, and bigger issue. Um, and so we have put out an, an idea that I guess I would argue is a complementary idea. Uh, the paper that uh, I think was available to everybody at the back of the room, I thought I had a copy to wave, but maybe I don't, um, uh, uh, by uh, our CAP associate Tim Westrich, uh, putting credit card debt on notice using electronic reminders to give consumers the right information at the right time. Um, the idea that is embodied in this proposal, and I think I would, it's fair to say what we're doing here today is trying to uh, uh, throw spaghetti up against a wall and see what sticks. It's to offer a new idea, a different way to think about disclosure. Um, in Washington, the debate has traditionally been about prohibiting particular practices or requiring more disclosure about those practices. But in many cases, the disclosure, as we all know, comes at a time with a lot of other information is provided and not necessarily helpful to you making a choice uh, when the moment comes that uh, the next step will have a consequence. Um, the, uh, the body of uh, behavioral economics research that has um, probably best described in the book Nudge by Cass Sunstein 
um, and others is uh, the notion that it uh, turns out American uh, consumers are very, very heavily influenced by how the choices are framed for them. And the choice is not simply the day you decide whether to get a city card or B of A card. That choice is made every single day with credit when you're essentially taking out a new loan, even if it's only for the $42.60 to fill up your gas tank and your SUV or whatever it might be. That's, in essence, a borrowing of some money, unless it's a debit card, for a period of time, and you're making a new decision. So the question is, what kind of information, how can we frame the choices at the teachable moment when a person is most interested uh, in thinking about the consequences of their uh, expenditures? Uh, Tim's paper suggests that, for example, a bank could automatically send a test message five business days before a bill's due date, warning the consumer that a late payment would result in a late fee and an increase in the APR. The message could include both the event, in this case the due date, and the consequence both a fee and potentially an increase to the penalty rate. Uh, credit card companies assess over $18 billion in penalty fees to their consumers each year. And many of these penalties, such as late payments, come with an additional burden of an increase in the underlying rate, or APR. So, and that can reach uh, uh, very, very high rates. So the consequence of late payments, the first and then often uh, subsequent late payments, can have a very significant effect on the overall uh, level of debt. And I think it's not those of us who've not always paid their bills on time, um, uh, because you're busy, uh, might have your behavior heavily influenced if you're reminded right before that moment, gee, you know, if instead of going and turning on the tube and watching uh, um, uh, uh, 30 Rock this evening, you were actually to pay your credit card bill, you might be able to save having that entire balance go into a different rate. You know what? That would influence my decision. How do I get most of my information in my email on my BlackBerry? And more and more Americans are like that as well. Um, uh, we suggest both that uh, before the due date, you could send them a reminder. We also suggest that they could get information uh, before they get close to their credit limits, that the consequence of going over the limit would have an effect. Uh, Congressman Maloney's bill suggests that perhaps you might be prohibited from going over your limit if you set it. Um, another thing that's relevant at the due date, people uh, have the option now of picking when their due date is in the month, but people don't always know that they have that option. If you're, uh, you get a notice that says your bill's in due in five days, and oh, by the way, you know, you could set it so that your bill is due on the 25th of the month. You know that payday is the 16th. You might make that choice. That's when you're thinking about it. It's the teachable moment. So uh, credit card companies are doing a lot of uh, uh, taking advantage of this technology to provide customer service, information that customers are seeking. The question is whether or not those same capacities can be used to sort of reform and improve the disclosure regime. I think both of those tools are designed, uh, whether the ways the companies have been using this technology today or Tim's proposal, are designed to try to get, to take advantage of technology to improve uh, both the experience of having a credit from a con customer's perspective and the consequences to the consumer and their capacity to continue to pay. Um, so uh, I hope that we can have a debate here today, both what, what are the card companies doing uh, in light of the uh, over sort of hang now of really an unsustainable level of debt. In many cases, the cardholders are underwater, don't have the income to support their debt levels, uh, as well as uh, a debate about the legislative proposal that is pending in Congress um, and the federal rules, and this new idea added to the mix. And for that, we have really a fabulous uh, uh, set of panelists. Um, first, we have Travis Pluckett, who's the Legislative Director of the Consumer Federation of America. Uh, Travis is uh, probably one of the foremost uh, consumer advocates in the country and uh, on these issues of credit card finance, widely cited around the country on the on, Can't Turn On a News Channel. Uh, without seeing his face and, is, and has been a real leader in driving the development of the legislation that Congressman Maloney has introduced. Uh, we're also very lucky to have Beth Koblener. Uh, Beth is an author of a book called Get a Financial Life, Personal Finance in Your 20s and 30s. She's been an active spokesperson on the financial concerns of Americans in their 20s and 30s, and she frequently speaks to young, uh, young people and uh, corporate audiences on these topics. She's worked extensively with the Federal Trade Commission's Project Credit Smarts campus outreach campaign. She was a staff writer for Money Magazine for eight years, wrote the money column for Glamour Magazine for six, contributed numerous articles to New York Times, and I think we'll wave a copy, or maybe you've given away to Congressman Maloney your 
your copy of the book to us, it, but it's, it's a, uh, um, a must see. Finally, we'll be joined by John Kerry, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of City Cards. In his role, John's responsible for business practices, customer privacy, control and compliance, consumer re community relations, card communications, and regulatory relationship management. In partnership with City's Global Government Affairs, responsible for advocating on behalf of the business on Capitol Hill. Uh, he was also appointed into, uh, to the Federal Reserve's Consumer Advisory Commission, advising the board on the exercise of its responsibilities under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. So I think uh, folks who uh, think about these issues day and night, and uh, Travis, do you want to begin? Sure, sure. Well, let me say first, what a pleasure it is to be here with uh, John and Beth and to have CAP out um, offering ideas on how we can you know, build on the consensus that, that really has uh, formed in Congress for r reform of abusive credit card practices and then start to help um, consumers get better information in a better format at a better time uh, that helps them, um, you know, decide what appropriate behavior, let's put it that way, is regarding uh, uh, their bill paying and, and other issues related to their credit card account. So I, I will largely focus my initial remarks on uh, on the CAP uh, paper, uh, and then we can we can talk during the Q and A session uh, about you know what might happen in the House or the Senate on credit card reform, and it it's also an honor to be here. She's not here anymore, but with Representative Maloney, who has almost single-handedly been at the at the sort of leading edge of pushing um, the need for reform in Congress. So um, on what CAP has proposed, a, a very interesting and I think potentially very uh, effective idea. As Sarah said, uh, we're using a, a technology that many people are very comfortable with. We're getting them information uh, at a time when they could take action to help themselves. Uh, and we are uh, accounting for the fact that there you know, are uh, psychological and behavioral biases in the way that consumers deal with credit and deal with bill payment. Uh, in particular, uh, we tend to underestimate our uh, likelihood of ending up in a situation where we may have to pay extra, for, for instance, in paying uh, a, a bill late. And we also tend to underestimate um, you know, the financial, but essentially what we owe, the financial consequences of uh, taking on credit. So. Um, it's a great idea if it does not, if it builds on, as Sarah said, the, the consensus for reform of abusive practices. It's not a substitute, obviously, uh, but if it's building on this consensus, it's, it's a good idea. And another positive factor, and we've been through this discussion in Congress in another context, it's personalized. Mr. Plunkett, you haven't paid your bill. <laughs> if you don't pay in five or seven days, uh, this is, you know, these are the consequences. You will end up paying a late fee of $39, and your interest rate on your existing balance uh, will double or triple. So the fact that it's personalized, we went through this discussion on uh, the, the question of the giving people information uh, about how long it will take them to pay off their existing credit card balance on the billing statement and what those costs would be. The fact that it's personalized makes a huge difference, I think, rather than being sort of a generic uh, boilerplate, you know, if you pay late, you will pay more, you know, kind of thing. There are two or three challenges here to this proposal, um, or involving this proposal. And um, the, the biggest is the, sort of the asymmetry of the disclosure. Um, that is, um, not, you know, not everybody who has a credit card is going to either have a cell phone or be comfortable using a cell phone uh, for receiving text messages and, and uh, using that information. Uh, we, we went through this discussion, in sort of the, the reverse of this discussion, when Congress put in, in 2000 a law on the books called the Electronic Signatures Act. And there the issue was, okay, now we have all this emerging technology, many people are comfortable using it, but most aren't yet. Uh, how do we make sure that the disclosures that are offered to these people, um, you know, online, are comparable um, to those that are being offered on paper. And how do we make sure 
that people really are comfortable getting the information electronically. And the Act actually did a fairly good job of providing consumers with, with rights to ensure that those two factors, you know, that the answer to those two questions was, was yes. So here the question is sort of the opposite. You, you've got many more people who are comfortable with technology and, and have cell phones and are comfortable receiving text messages. But uh, based on, you know, talking to people like John and other credit card issuers, we still, we, we know that there are still uh, a very large number of people who uh, don't pay their bills online and probably aren't comfortable doing business online or even re receiving a, you know, a, a notice such as this. And the idea that CAP has proposed is that they will link, you know, this disclosure, uh, you know, it's a legal requirement unless you provide this disclosure in the instances that Sarah described, uh, then you can't raise, you know, the interest rate or you can't assess the penalty fee or you can't charge an over limit fee. That is an important protection that we want to make sure is applied equally to those who can't uh, or won't use this new technology. And we need to think through what is the suitable alternative, uh, the, the, the equivalent alternative that is equally rapid, uh, that it provides the information at the teachable moment, um, and that isn't a text message on a cell phone. Is it a phone call? Is it a... Uh, uh, a, you know, a, a separate envelope, um, you know, not part of the billing statement that an issuer mails. Uh, what, what are the alternatives that will work? Because we really can't provide a protection to one segment of the population, not provide an equivalent protection to the other. So um, I, I think that is the single largest challenge uh, in, involving the idea. Um, the, uh, one other thing to think about, and this came up during the debate over the Electronic Signatures Act, simply because something is is uh, sent to uh, a consumer doesn't mean it's received. I mean, there are any number of reasons that we all know about uh, that that would be the case. Uh, technology problems, switching, you know, internet providers, et cetera. And I'll be interested to hear from John, you know, as to how issuers are dealing with this challenge. I mean, it, there should be some uh, duty of care to ensure um, that there's a pretty darn good chance that people are going to receive what is sent uh, electronically. And um, that was something we struggled with in 2000, and it might be an issue here. We have to, we have to think that through. OK, great. John, do you want to uh, share some thoughts and reactions? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think we ought to step back for just a, a little bit, and, and let's frame where we are, because I think that's important. Um, two significant rules have come out in the last uh, you know, I guess just before Christmas, it was the credit card industry's credit, uh, Christmas present. Um, and and uh, in essence, it did two really dramatic things. It, I think the, it did, um, the first thing is it dramatically changed the rules around Regulation Z and the disclosures that consumers get. It took the Fed four plus years, I can't keep count, in its ability in, in, in drafting these rules, first through an ANPR process, ultimately through um, um, a commenting process and then yet another round. And what it really does is, for the first time, uh, it creates, I think, um, far more transparency for consumers. We don't see it yet. We haven't seen it yet because it's going to take some time to build it. Um, but when, if you go and you look at the Fed rule, and particularly if you go back and you look at the attachments in the back, literally what's happening is they're going to, the way this information is going to be presented to consumers will be literally at every important moment in the customer's life. So at the time there's a solicitation, at the time uh, the customer is approved for an account, or time when the terms are going to um, take effect. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, when there would be a change in terms. There's a 45-day notice period. There's a whole lot of extra protections against it. But it's much like, and I, some of you have heard me talk about it, it's much like what food labeling has done when they implemented that in the middle 1960s, people snickered at it and said, well, it's just it's another government program. You know, how can consumers use it? But the fact is, people do. I use it every day. I figure out how many carbohydrates I'm going to eat, and that helps me guide what my diet is. Um, so th that's, that's not here now. So what you have currently is a marketplace, and I, I've described this before, where, where, where basically it's not transparent. The marketplace is not working. You could have essentially two credit cards they're identical, right? Identical. And one is 
very, very transparent. It's got all the disclosures in the back that are written by lawyers for lawyers or, or for to meet regulatory requirements. Both of them have it. And one is very transparent about what's there, and one is not. One has got palm trees and aspirational pictures or barbarians of the gate or whatever they got. And, and, and they literally, the, these things, these offers get confronted to consumers and, 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 they, and they make a choice. And are they making a fully informed choice? And the fact is, no. So I, I've, been, uh, I've been a strong advocate of what I, what I think the Fed was doing around it because I didn't feel that there was a fully functioning marketplace where competitors could, could compete on best practices. So anyway, so that's done. And so a lot of the confusion around um, that consumers might have about their statements, not being able to read it, it's all kind of set out. They, they, they did it in front of focus groups, and they went back and did it again. They did a lot, a lot of work around it. And I, I urge you, if you don't know about it, it's not about disclosures. It's about informing consumers. So that's number one. Number two is everything that, that uh, Congresswoman Maloney talked about uh, in, her, in her legislation is except, I think, two pieces, but there may be other pieces, are essentially addressed in the reg uh, by the Fed through the, uh, this elaborate rulemaking process that they went through. Um, you know, 60,000 comments had the benefit of basically everyone who had, a, had an interest in participating, I'm convinced did. Uh, and they came back, I think, um, with very strong rules about uh, a number of things. But the one that everybody seems to focus on most is around pricing and the ability to reprice, the ability to reprice existing balances. For all intents and purposes, except in very extreme circumstances, it can't happen. It can't happen. It's done. And, and the business, so that's, that's the big piece. You know, stuff about uh, two-cycle billing, stuff about um, uh, payment allocation methodology. A, a, a lot of the issues that, that um, were outlined and are outlined in, in, the, in um, uh, Mrs. Maloney's legislation are covered there. Um, uh, and I think essentially uh, the, what I can figure is there, there are two that are not, um, and, and perhaps we'll get in the Q&A about why they're not there. What's different is, and I think where we have concerns, is in two areas. One is uh, if, the, if we don't get this right, if it doesn't work, it's pretty hard to fix it through a legislative process where it is much easier to solve it through the regulatory process. It's not, it's not easy. There's a, there's a lot of work that would have to be done, but it would be, to my lights, politically impossible, particularly in this environment, to actually go and propose legislation in any foreseeable future that might be viewed by anybody as benefiting the credit card industry. It's not going to happen. So if they get it wrong, if we were to take the UDAP, legislate, UDAP regs and flip it into law, and they got it wrong, we'd be in a mess. Um, and, the, and the second issue is around timing, and I think uh, at some point in time we ought to talk about that. Um, so that addresses a lot of the concerns that are, are out there about transparency. And, um, now, the, the, the proposal, as most of the major issuers, or certainly the major issuers that everybody's familiar with, that technology is already in place. You literally can, you can, you can schedule a payment, you can do auto pay, you can get notices how many days in advance, it can tell you when you're, how close you are to your, uh, your limit. You literally can get, you can design whatever alerts you want in order to manage your business. And, and in fact, it's something that we encourage our customers to do. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's basically self-interested. If we can get customers to go all E, the amount of money we will save and the amount of paper that we will save in being having to send statements every and mail and all those costs and the receiving them and opening the envelopes, if we had an all-e environment, there would be dramatic cost reduction for the industry. It's not possible to be able to do that unless customers opt in. So we market it hard. We, you know, we offer the opportunity for people to participate. We, if, they give, if they give us an email address, we'll send them an email and say, you know, you have these tools available to you. There's lots of marketing on it. When you get on the VRU, if you were to call in, they tell you how you can access, um, how you can access these alerts and be able to check your balances. So there's a lot of work around that. And that's, I think that's great. It leaves it up to the customer to be able to do that. So disclosures, uh, much better. Statements, the teachable moment. You want to be reminded to pay your bill? When you get the bill, 
That's your teachable moment. It's something that has to be paid. How many times do you need to tell a consumer that they must pay their bill? They have the tools available to them to actually go and make, uh, the, decide how they want to do it, and the performance on us is terrific. From our perspective, loan losses are lower. There's a much more engaged customer. We have the things we want. We, we, we bring these to the customer, and we let them make those choices. I, I think the, the proposal is uh, challenging. I, think, I get Travis's point, and I think he's exactly right, is that you know, in many ways it's sort of an uneven playing field. And as I was thinking about this, and I'm going to make a dangerous statement, but you know, if we're going to go that far, and that we're going to require that consumers provide this information, then why don't we go further? Why don't we actually get the ACH information from the customer and that the bank would pull an automatic payment, minimum payment every single month. If the customer wants to pay more, great. But if they don't, they're never in hot water. They're always current. Now, you, all of us would just go, we would chafe at that notion that somehow the government would require that these funds would transfer over and go to someplace else. But to me, it all comes down to choice. We provide these things. We think they provide the competitive edge. It's to our economic advantage to have consumers do this and we want them to come. But we, you know, we build it and we hope that they will come. And, and uh, so anyway, so that's, I um, hope made some controversial remarks and I'm looking forward to uh, more questions. Beth, do you wanna go and then we can maybe talk amongst ourselves and, sure. and ask a few other questions <coughs> to the audience. Right, I have two sets of comments. First of all, thank you to Sarah and to Cap and it's great to be here. Um, and uh, my two sets of comments are having to do with, first of all, the how this all impacts young people, people in their 20s and 30s. It's a topic I've been writing about for over 15 years now. Um, and I was asked just to talk a little bit about the impact of credit card debt on young people. Um, and I wanted to sort of go through a poll uh, in 1991. Money Magazine, Yankelovich for the, did a poll that found for the first time young people feel they're not going to live as well as their parents. Uh, in 2000, 10 years later, uh, Time and Yankelovich did the same poll, and again, the vast majority, 65%, said they don't think they'll live as well as their parents. Um, and while the same poll hasn't been done last year, MTV and AP did a poll, and they found that the number one source of unhappiness for people in their 20s and 30s are financial issues. So that's more than their concerns about jobs, school, their parents, which is good news for parents out there, um, failing, death, or even the evils of the world. So young people are really, really concerned about their finances. And the question I was asked was why? Um, and if you just look at the statistics real quickly, incomes from people 25 to 34 after you adjust for inflation on average are 10% lower than they were in the early 1970s. And this is including men and women with college educations, without college educations. On average, that whole group is earning 10% less after you adjust for inflation than the early 1970s. And of course, as we all know, the debt loads are dramatically higher. We have the average college student graduating with $20,000 in student loans, and according to PERG, uh, $2,600 in credit card debt. Um, it, people ages 25 to 34, 65% have credit cards, and 70% are carrying a balance from month to month, meaning they're not they're not paying it off in full. Maybe they're making those minimum monthly payments. Um, and I think one of the big things I've noticed in the last almost two decades is attitudinal changes. You know, I speak on college campuses. I've been to you know, community colleges, Ohio State, to Harvard. And across the board, I feel like young people, people who are right out of college in their 20s, view credit in a very different way than people did 20, 30 years ago. At, you know, Harvard, great school, Kids were saying to me, well, I have my savings account, and I have my checking account, and then my credit account, and I draw from each of those without even realizing that a credit card is a loan. Um, I've had people say to me, you know, I got to college, I didn't have a job, I didn't have any income, and yet I get a, got a credit card. Um, and it's a high-rate credit card. The average for student credit cards now is 14%. And of course, this sounds frighteningly similar to the subprime mortgage crisis. You know, if you don't have a job, you don't have an income, and you're given a loan that has a high rate, it's sort of not a great scenario for success. Um, also, what Congressman, Congresswoman Maloney had talked about the idea of limits. You know, a lot of people, young people, 
people say to me, look, I, I got a credit card, it was for $500, and the credit card company keeps raising the amount, and I tell them, please don't do that, but every time I turn around, I can borrow $1,000, $2,000, $5,000. I don't even want all this credit. And of course, the issue of, you know, years ago, you pull out a credit card and you go to a restaurant, it's really embarrassing when it's declined. Well, that doesn't happen anymore because the banks have figured out, you know, it's better to not decline the person, just give them a bigger loan, give them more money, and charge a higher interest rate for it. So there's a lot, a big attitudinal change that I've personally seen. Um, and of course, when, when banks have been aggressively going after college students, I think a lot in the last decade or so, the hope was, in, in many cases, that parents might come in to foot the bill if they have a college student who gets into trouble. And of course, now that parents are seeing their 401ks decline by half, you're suddenly in a situation where many parents are not in the you know, frame of mind, nevertheless have the money to pay back um, their students' defaulted debts. So we see a larger chunk of young people um, using their after a larger chunk of their after-tax income to cover monthly bills. In, the, in 2000, it was 20% of after-tax income. Now it's 25%. And this really understates the, the problem because the, this data, which comes from the Federal Reserve, looks at what people pay each month. Um, and they're looking at, in many cases, we know a lot of people, just particularly younger people, pay just the minimum monthly payments. So you're saying they're putting 25% um, of their um, monthly income toward payments, well, actually, it understates the problem because if they're only paying the minimum, imagine if they were paying more than the minimum. That would be a bigger chunk of their income. Um, you know, the other reasons why young people don't think they'll live as well as their parents, you know, you look at everything from housing, a larger chunk of their salaries are going to housing. One in four young people, 18 to 34, have no health insurance. It's the largest cohort. 18 to 35-year-olds are the largest cohort that don't have any health insurance. Um, and this was all before the recession hit. All this information took place before we saw this major um, economic um, firestorm. And now that young people are graduating from college uh, and they have high debts, both student loan debt and their credit card debt, and they can't get a job, they're pretty worried that they're not going to live all that well. So those are sort of my general comments, and I have a whole bunch of technology-specific comments that we could talk about maybe during the Q&A. All right, thanks. I just wanted to um, actually go back to this question of uh, technological uh, feasibility and what uh, is and isn't possible and sort of what's fair and what's not, because I think that's an interesting set of problems. Maybe, Beth, this is a way for you to bring some of your concerns about students in. Um, I was actually surprised. Um, I, I lived through the Esine Wars. Uh, I remember the, the challenges in that context uh, of trying to design something uh, that worked. And I, I remember the, the struggle being twofold. One, that you were dealing with uh, a market where there was very uneven access. Um, I do think that's better, but as you know, not solved. Uh, and I was surprised no one mentioned the fact that uh, people's phone numbers change so frequently, in this, particularly low-income people. Uh, where, uh, especially when you have portable burner cell phones, that sort of thing, uh, some of the people we're most worried about getting access to, if you have a text address or an email address and it's changed, that's going to be hard to ensure receipt of the information. Um, uh, the other thing I was struck by is that when we were talking about eSign, we were talking about the technology we knew at the moment. And one of the hardest parts of regulation is figuring out something that will be flexible enough for the, the changes. I heard your concern about legislation. I, I know housing areas very well. I don't think when Congress writes underwriting standards in legislation, as it did, for example, with the Help for Homeowners legislation, doesn't always work out so well. Um, and the ability to make adjustments uh, to that kind of fine-grained work is, is, is a problem. I, I hear that concern. Um, on the other hand, I think it is uh, 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 difficult to ensure that you're, when you set parameters in, in legislation, uh, when you've had a Fed that's been highly reluctant to use its, uh, its UDAP authority for, I mean, the, what's remarkable is that this, uh, that these regulations are really the first time that the Fed has used authority it's had on the books for decades to, in, in this space. And so uh, it's hard for people to be comfortable that the regulatory bodies are going to be able to be responsive and receptive to emerging practices. So I've asked a bunch of different questions there. I'd ask one, one about this question of coverage and availability of sort of consistent ways of contacting your consumers. I think you guys have solved for some of those problems in giving people information when they're 
in default. Uh, I, they're pretty good at finding people and letting them know that they owe you money. Um, but I, I'm curious about how some of that might be adapted. And then also this other question about how do we think about uh, technology when the technology we're likely to have in three years is something that perhaps none of us can even conceive of. I don't know who might want to take on any of that. Um, yeah, a lot, of, lot of issues there. Um, again, I think the technology, um, you know, I think over, you know, there's a lot of competition around the comp technology and, and, the, and the support that each of the, you know, providing that stuff. It's def definitely a differentiator, and the trick for the uh, the competitors in the industry is to have the state of the start the start stuff. Um, um, you know, like for example, one of the things we're working on, one of our competitors already has it. We're going to have it by the end of, end of first quarter. Is SMS real play? Like, what is my balance? And then being able to have that, and then get the relay back. That's slick. I mean, that would be really nice to know. I'm at the point. I want to make a purchase. I want to know whether I'm going to go over a limit or not. I haven't gotten an alert recently. Maybe I'll check it. Or did my payment arrive? So there's there's a lot of that going on, and we're testing into it. Um, and I think that that's going to add some. Uh, I think that's going to add some additional support. This is the, one of the areas where issuers will compete. Um, I, I am stumped at, at how you uh, how you provide that level playing field. I think Travis's point is right, um, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, at least in the card space, where it wasn't it didn't happen in the financial services space, as you, as you probably know, is that there wasn't a, an adoption. Uh, that the customer literally had to, and the way it works is got a, it's very cumbersome to get a customer to go all e. They have to sign into it. They you have to send a confirmating email back. Then they got to confirm it back. And there's a fair amount of friction to be able to do it. We think it's the place to go. So we're driving that, and we're doing contests and save a tree, plant a tree campaign for everybody, doing lots of things that try and get people to do that. Uh, but I don't have a solution to the to how you cover that gap. Here. You know, and, and, I, and I must say, um, you know, it's an area that I'm very concerned about. But the the core business of the you know the major credit card players, some of them have a, other pieces of, but the core business in the bank card space is really in the prime space. You know, their subprime in America is, you know, if you use just one indicator of 660 FICO, it represents about 30 percent of Americans. And and if you go and you look at any of the portfolios of loans on assets. Not just on accounts, but on assets. Uh, what you'd see is that um, is that the, they're underweighted, um, and that's securitization data that you could see from any of the issuers' trusts. And that, those are those are the revolving balances. Those aren't the ones that just basically pay off. So it's it's a real it's a real number, and it it, it hovers more around the 25 percent, and it's even not at it's even not at um, it, the way you look at it is. The way I look at the portfolio is what was the credit um, score when you booked the account, and I would venture to say that there are very few issuers out there that are booking accounts below 660. They get they, there's migration, but there's very few that do. So it's a space that I don't. It's a space that I just don't have a lot of familiarity with. The, the issue is also, um, you know, as John well knows, you know, when good accounts go bad. Uh, in a, in a difficult uh, uh, economic environment, with many issuers reporting their their highest uh, or close to their highest charge-off rates ever, uh, and many folks predicting that uh, nationally will will either get close to or or um, exceed the uh, previous highs on delinquencies and and uh, charge-offs by the end of the year. So it. it for us, the issue isn't just you know what you would call the subprime space, but uh, folks who um, may be a little bit on the lower uh, end of the spectrum regarding um, income, uh, who have heretofore been just fine um, in terms of their FICO and, and uh, credit worthiness, who in the pressure of this uh, economic situation are, are in trouble. And I, I think your point on phone numbers is is dead on. We, uh, it'd be interesting to note whether uh, the um, fact, you know, that people were changing, especially at the lower income end of the spectrum, changing phone numbers more frequently has changed since we now have, you know, phone number portability. Uh, I don't know one way or the other whether lower income folks are taking 
or let, let's say, John, you know, moderate income folks are taking more advantage of that than, say, more affluent um, uh, consumers. But uh, nonetheless, it, it could be a big problem. Yeah, I mean, I also, the statistics I saw show that eight, uh, people 18 to 34, 20 percent of them are using cell phones for banking already. So 20 percent of people ages 18 to, to, to 34 are using their cell phone. You know, and you, uh, like text messages for this group, people on average send 19 a day. And they use their cell phone for like 10 calls. So I feel like sort of, I mean, I think that's obviously a very important issue. Who doesn't have this technology? Who's not using this technology? But there's such a large cohort of this, you know, Generation Y who is using it vociferously, you know, that it sort of seems to be a smart banking business. You know, I was talking to a technology, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday and a technology analyst quoted, I, I spoke with him yesterday and I was, and he said, you know, this technology saves banks money. It's, you know, reducing cons customer service time um, and it's stickiness, helping keep customers and, and sort of getting that next boom of people, the generation Y, the next baby boom. Um, but the one thing I was, um, I think I would caution about, because um, he was saying before, which is true that, you know, I know Bank of America, for example, has 41 different alerts that you can choose from a menu and decide how you want it to be alerted. Um, and even uh, the Super Bowl, which I watched for the first time this year, Chase had a commercial about, um, about you can ch use your text message to your phone to check your balance. Or, um, so it's definitely getting out there. But um, I think it's really important that these teachable moments and the point that Tim made in his paper and you have made, Sarah, is if you tell somebody after the fact, you know, the day after you get a text message saying, oops, you went over your account balance or you, you're late, we're going to hit you with a late fee. I mean, I was thinking this is sort of a gross analogy, but it's like giving a panel and afterwards somebody sent, telling you you have spinach in your teeth. Well, at the end, you know, you want to be told at the beginning. You want to know, I'm going to make a mistake at the teachable moment being at the, the point of purchase when they run your card through. Is there a way to either get a text message or something where they say, you know, you're going over your balance or, or you get a text message saying in the next five days if you don't pay your bill, you're going to be late. Now, I understand your point, how many times you have to tell somebody something. But as a mother, <laughs> I would argue, you have to keep telling them. And, and because we have this technology right now that's already in place, certainly there's a, the cohort of, you know, the bigger problem is how do you reach everybody, but the cohort of people who are using this technology and are having dramatic problems with their credit card debt. There's sort of an easy way. Now, I just, I'd be curious to know how the banks would feel about this because, as you said at the beginning, they make $18 billion in late, you know, based on fees. So it's a tricky, tricky question. Well, I, I, number, number of terrific points, hey, and I, I think it's great. Uh, uh, first of all, the adoption rate for e-business uh, e uh, on the people under 30 is, that's where they're doing it. That's where they're doing their banking. And that's where they manage their credit. And that's where, when, when we have the email address, you know, we offer them the opportunity to select in it. It's, it's, we give them the opportunity to do that, and we send that, but we do not decide what's the best thing for them. It's, a lot of this is, do we, do, a lot of this is, you know, how do we get them to adopt it? Do we pass a law and require consumers to provide this personal information or not? I mean, that's really that simple a question. Um, uh, you know, I think there are, the, 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 your point about the alerts, you can set your alerts any way you want to set them. I want to know when I get within $500 of my balance, $2,000 of my, of my credit limit. I want to know when I'm five days before my due date. I want to know when my payment was made. I want to know how I want to manage that account. And that's where banks and institutions are basically competing in that space. Um, you know, point about the student, student stuff. I, I, I have to tell you, I have, I have three sons. Uh, two of them are over, uh, just one's over, just over 18 and the other one's 21. Both of them have credit cards that they applied for. They didn't apply for them in a student card. They just applied for them, had summer jobs, put their income in. Son called me up one day and said, uh, I screwed up. And I said, well, what's up? And he said, I, uh, I missed a payment. And I said, well, you know, what should I do? And I said, well, you know what you should do. You should engage. If you have not paid your bill, you have an obligation to pay it. Pick up the phone and call them. Tell them you're going to send the payment and ask them if they'll waive the fee or what would happen. I want people to engage. Um, uh, so uh, 
the performance on our credit card, on, on, this, on the basically what I would say the young adult population, we're not talking about children now, we're talking about adults, people who send to Iraq and people that w who can marry and people who can enter into legal contracts, that performance on those accounts are actually as good as the prime, account, prime business. It, 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 it's, it's a terrific business. Why? Well, we manage it carefully. We send alerts to students. We make sure that we, you know, all the marketing messages that are in statements are actually talking to them about the importance of making more than the minimum payment. We actually have a, a card program that actually incents people to pay more and rewards them for paying, not for purchasing. Again, we, 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 we provide this space and we let the individual make the decisions and let the market drive that. We want to be able to do that. We think it's an important, we believe that it's an important differentiator. Um, um, you know, I, 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 go, I go back, I think the way we ought to look at it more though is that it isn't about students. Because if it's about students, we're talking about a protected class of the most highly educated, affluent people in, in the country. And how strange is that? Why, won't, why don't we talk about people who are new to credit? And what can we do to people who are new to credit? And how ought we ought to manage that differently? And I think that that's a remarkably different conversation. Um, um, you know, I, I, um, I, I remember when I was 18, and actually when I was 22, and I went for my first job and I couldn't get a credit card. I couldn't get a credit card. I finally had my employer actually write a letter and I went down to a local bank and they were able to give me a $500 choice card. And if I handled it properly, maybe someday I'd get an Amex card. That was very difficult. Um, the performance in these cards are terrific, um, um, and I think they manage them well. Uh, if you go and you look at the portfolio data, what you'd say is that they're not highly utilized. They're about, you know, they're basically at 25% of their outstanding balance. You know, I'm sorry, outstanding credit line. So they've got 75% open to buy, and they're making more than minimum payments. Some months they're making minimum payments. Some months they're paying it off. And I guess the last piece I want to say is a lot of the issues that, that students are dealing with right now are much larger issues. Think about what people are paying for now, using credit cards for. They're paying because they can't, because health care is so expensive, because education is so expensive. You know, people are being burdened with these things, and what ends up happening is the demon on this is the cards business. I don't get it. The demon on this is that there are many, many issues out there in the public space that need to be solved. And actually, thank goodness, there is at least some liquidity out there that helps people cover those costs off. Um, I want to close this out by saying, first of all, to acknowledge that last point, I, I, I don't think there's anyone here who would suggest that uh, the availability of credit is not an enormous uh, uh, benefit to consumers at every level. Uh, who are able to uh, be able to manage through vicissitudes of their income, to be able to plan for higher levels of income in the future, if that it make, make some uh, sometimes entrepreneurial investments. I, I always love the Spike Lee made his first movie on his credit cards. Um, not everyone's as lucky as he is and how that turned out, but um, uh, I, I, I don't think there's any dispute about the, the importance of making sure that we're able to offer people tools so that they can use credit responsibly. I think there's a very interesting development happening in uh, the field of behavioral economics where people are beginning to learn that the paradigm that we had before, and I actually I agree with you that the Reg Z regulations in some ways have finally gotten to the place of maybe better transparency, but in some ways in the old paradigm of information, which was let's give everybody all the information they need and let them make the choice. It's a kind of perfect, uh, uh, if, if you could ideally, how do you achieve perfect informed consent? And what the economics is showing us is that, or the research is showing us is that unfortunately that we're, we're all human beings and we're flawed and we're not capable of absorbing information and being perfectly informed. We often act based on the choice that's before us at a particular moment, relying only on part of the information that's available to us. You may array, give me 42 choices of alerts, but I either may have, as in my case, not yet gone to sign up for my alerts, uh, or I uh, have made some uninformed choices about which are the right to do, because we're not that sophisticated of consumers, most of us. Uh, and so the question is whether there is a role for public policy in trying to inform how those choices are framed, not to prohibit 
people from making an informed choice to something that may be more difficult for them to manage, but whether it should nudge them in the direction of what is more likely to be the better option for more people. There are enormous challenges of how do you make sure that information is available to everybody. There are uh, questions about whether or not being able to shape people should be a substitute for or in addition to prohibit in some practices which we would think maybe nobody should ever be able to opt into. Um, all of those are questions, but I think what we wanted to do today, there's been discussion about um, uh, 401k defaults if people are told they have to affirmatively choose not to save money into their 401k as opposed to affirmatively choose to it. Rates of savings in 401ks grow up dramatically in a very beneficial to consumers and beneficial to society way. Uh, there's increasingly discussion about whether 30-year fixed rate mortgages ought to be, everyone should be given a choice of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. One of our colleagues, Michael Barr, published a paper about this at New America. Uh, should they be given the choice of the 30-year fi fixed rate mortgage at the same time whatever someone is marketing to them? Uh, a, a, a proposal for perhaps an arm or a, another kind of term. Are there ways in which we can frame the choices so that we recognize the human frailty, the, the, the limitations of humans' ability to absorb I information and move beyond the sort of the paradigm of inform perfect informed choice to a new model that's a little more realistic? And I really appreciate everybody's willingness to be part of this dialogue today. We have unfortunately run out of time. Are we allowed to? We can take, okay, two questions from the audience. So back there. Uh oh, uh, no, no, no customer support questions uh, no, no, until the camera's support. off. <laughs> it's not a customer support Thank question. You. It's a question about reconciling statements. So I'm a customer of Citibank, and I actually got caught in an interesting little bind. But I'm, this isn't a, a specific story about me. But on your financial, if you if you look for Citibank's Office of Financial Education, there's a statement there that says you're committed to helping people spend, save, invest, borrow, and manage their debt wisely. Yet you currently have, Citibank currently has, and Citibank's one of the better banks, currently has a policy, this payment allocation policy, where if you, when you make payments, your payments are allocated to your lowest interest rate balance before their, your highest interest rate balance. No financially literate person would ever enter into a transaction like that. So how do you reconcile making a statement that says we want to educate our customers with policies that only someone who is financially illiterate would, un, would entertain? Uh, a couple things. One is the rule. The Reg Z actually adopts it. That's going to that's gonna go into effect. Uh, the, um, yeah, I think it's a pretty, a pretty straightforward question. First of all, people who use balance transfers and stuff, they know how to use it. They get it. They understand how it works. Get it. One interest rate's at zero and the other interest rate's at 18%. And let's say they got 1,000 in each and then basically have a blended rate of nine. And over time, what ends up happening is it's, it, 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 it goes back up to the 18%. It's a significant savings there, okay? That is, the, you know, that is, uh, you know, you, you, you may not like it. And I think the Fed ultimately came back and said, look, we, this, is, this is an area that we think ought to stop. But you know why they really said that? Is because I think it was to your point, which is consumers can't understand it. It's counterintuitive and it ought to stop. Now. Um, the fact is, if we're going to be able to offer those balance transfer offers, we can either offer them or not. And if we can't offer them, right, we can't, uh, we can't uh, compete in the competitive space. I can't offer a 0% a, a offer and have somebody at 18% constantly making and renewing charges, because what would I have? I'd have zero, mar I'd have so much margin compression, I'd be upside down. It doesn't work. It, it simply doesn't work. Now, your issue around disclosures, if you read the disclosures pretty carefully around those balance transfers, you'll see it's, it actually tries to give you an example. What this means is if you have higher price balances, they will be paid down, for, they will be paid down last, and your lowest price balances will be paid down first. All part of the disclosure. So, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, as I said, this is, not a, this is not a big driver. In fact, I, we're getting complaints from consumers who say, hey, wait a minute, you mean to say that we're no longer going to see these rich offers in the future for life alone and those kinds of things? And the answer is, yeah, that's right, because we can't, you can't manage the business at zero margin compression. So um, a couple points I think, that I think is worth just going real, because I, I, there's a couple things I really agree with you. And, uh, legislation around an opt-out, 
Now, maybe that's the solution to this issue, like the 401k. So assuming that there is a capability, asking, you know, the box is pre-checked, that you're going to be willing to take all that you're willing to do that, you know, give the phone number when you do it, and the customer has to affirmatively opt out. Well, that's, that, that would be a way to solve part of the problem. Opt out of alerts. Opt out of alerts. So you'd, you'd give the customers, a, you know, the presumption is you're going to get alerts and fill in the phone number. But if you don't want it, you have a choice to say, no, I don't want that. I don't want people telling me how I'm going to manage my business. The other piece, I think, which is really the problem, and it's around financial literacy. And it's, it is in the stories about people not knowing at Harvard that they don't know that when they're making a credit card purchase that it's actually a loan is incredible to me. But again, that's a systemic problem that we have. When I grew up, people were, you know, the very first lesson around money was counting it. You ask, when I asked my son, do you ever, anybody ever teach you how to count money? He said, you and I did, you know, you taught me that. You didn't learn it in school? No, I didn't, they don't teach it in school. There isn't built into the curriculum what, what you'll get from teachers, organizations, others, and say, we can't afford to do any more teaching. But what we ought to do is we ought to change the curriculum so that people are really, so we have a, an improved financial literacy across this country. Dropping, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in adult financial literacy is, you know, people will say it really isn't, effect, isn't as effective as actually teaching them all through their lives. And I think that that's a lot of the solution that needs to be done as well. You know, John's made a lot of good points here, but I, I can't let the payment allocation remark go uh, <laughs> uncontested. It's, uh, he, he's right, people don't understand uh, the, the fact they, they can't choose uh, to act differently because they're only informed that this is the payment allocation process after they've made uh, you know, an, an arrangement to either do a balance transfer or have, have a higher interest rate. Uh, this blended rate, John, is talking about what the Federal Reserve says and what uh, uh, Representative Maloney has said is that what that means is they're, they're not being honest up front. They're not being straight up front about what that, that the real deal is uh, on the balance transfer. So, uh, you know, what the rule says and what uh, Maloney's bill says is you're, that's what you're going to have to do in the future. I suspect, I mean, you're in the business, I'm not, uh, but I suspect that because it's an important way that issuers acquire customers that they're going to continue to offer uh, reduced interest rate deals in some form. And if it means that they have to be more honest up front about, you know, what that costs, that, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, I, who knows what the business is going to do? It, I think people, it's going to take, uh, I think people are still trying to figure out what that is. So I, it, it's, it's hard to say what it will be. But I, I do disagree with Travis literally right with the offer is the statement about how the, the payments get allocated. So there isn't, there, there isn't now, now whether, whether, so you, you whether they understand people that. People don't understand Well, the, I, I'm taking So how that, can they well, process it and act on it? No, but let me finish. What, what I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying what the Fed came out with their studies, I don't know whether they understand it or not. My point with the Fed is if that's the case, then fine. Then we should, then that's a practice that ought to be stopped. That's where, that's where I was. I have no data to know whether they were doing it or not. I can tell you on the back end, it's not a big driver of customer complaints. It's not a big driver of customer complaints. People who use it, they know how to use it, and they use it aggressively, and they use it well. It's, it, 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 when we go look at all the ten top things, that doesn't show up as number five, six, or seven. It's down below. It's not a big driver. I think with that, I need to bring this discussion to a close. What this last exchange showed, I think, is how much, uh, if nothing else, I thank you all for being here so that I had the ex opportunity to have the debate about these issues with this terrific panel. So please join me in thanking Travis and Beth and John.